Good morning, everyone. Is this on? Is this on? Yeah. Good morning, everyone. My name is Donna DeLong, and I'd like to welcome you to today's session 97 called Leveraging Data Analytics to Complement Value Based Approach. And I'm honored to serve as a moderator this morning because, like each of you, I'm very interested in looking forward to learning more about the information being shared by our presenter during this session. Um, before I introduce the speaker, just a little housekeeping tabs, uh, you know, tips. Please turn off your cell phone, and um, you can find the slides for this by navigating to the session number 97, Leveraging Data Analytics to Complement Value-Based Approach in the Mobile Application. So to introduce our speaker, Nathan Riggle is the Director of Analytics at Mercy ACO in Des Moines, Iowa, which is a subsidiary of Mercy Health Network. In this role, Nathan manages the analytic, data, and IT work that support the care management and the population health initiatives at the organization. In analytics, Nathan leads data mining and other analytic projects that help Mercy ACO achieve positive patient outcomes and success in their more than 10 value-based contracts. This analytic work is supported by a network-wide data lake that contains over 80 EMR data feeds and all of the ACO claims data of which Nathan also oversees. Finally, this data lake serves as the key source for the ACO's care management platform, which Nathan is actively involved in managing. So please join me this morning in, in um, offering a warm welcome to our speaker. <clears throat> thank you, Donna, and thank you all for coming. We've got a great audience for early morning. Um, let me escape out of this. We'll get to the slides. All right. All right, so Nathan Riggle, um, thanks again, Donna. Thank you all for attending. Um, before we begin, um, I'm a, you know, conflict of interest, full disclaimer. Um, I'm an employee of Mercy ACO. Mercy ACO is a client of Innovacer. And Innovacer has sole ownership of many of the platforms I'll be alluding to today. So quick personal detail I'll share to start off. Um, four weeks ago at this moment, my wife was going into labor. Um, and that went great. Um, I'm, I'm mainly bringing it up, though, because last night was the best night of sleep I've had in four weeks. So <laughs> I think that should bode well for this presentation, but we'll see. Um, I had forgot what REM feels like, but it, it still feels good. Um, so anyways, besides that, really excited to be here, share a little bit more about Mercy ACO, some of our challenges and what we've done to address those challenges. So um, quick agenda, we'll be going over a little bit of background. I'll then talk to you about our strategic priorities, some of our IT initiatives to address those priorities, um, our overall strategy um, pillars, and then end with a little bit of kind of what were the results of doing these things and some, some closing thoughts and Q&A. So the learning objectives for today, um, first one is talking about how to take advantage of multiple data sources. There's, there's um, lots of different great data in the healthcare space. There's a few key, um, Q -fee da Q a few key data sets, um, and we're big proponents in using, you know, taking advantage of those multiple data sets and trying to get them to talk together. Um, then once you have that data, um, data is a great way to enable your strategies. Um, and then once you have insights, um, those insights are great to help influence your operation. So I'll talk to you a little bit about the, the infrastructure decisions we've made that have worked for us, as well as some of the growth strategies we've, we've chosen. So a little bit about Mercy ACO. A um, couple funny things to me about this slide. Um, so we are in Iowa. There's the common joke, most people think this should be a shape of Idaho or Ohio, but this is what Iowa looks like in the middle of, we're in the middle of the country, and there's also a lot of different mercies, so um, always some ambiguity about mercy in Iowa, but Mercy ACO is a subsidiary of Mercy Health Network, which actually just changed our name to Mercy One. So as you can see on the map, uh, Mercy One is a, is a provider organization, hospitals and clinics across the state of Iowa, um, our biggest market is Des Moines, but there's several smaller markets across the state. Um, in 2012, we launched Mercy ACO. So we formed an MSSP 
um, ACO, um, Central, Central and Des Moines. Since then, we've expanded to our other Iowa markets. And we now have four Medicare shared savings programs, two of them with downside risk. Um, kind of the easy way to describe our ACO coverage from a value-based standpoint is we basically have 300,000 lives. A third of that is Medicare shared savings. A third of that is uh, managed Medicaid, and a third is commercial. So for, for a smaller state, um, a pretty big, pretty big coverage, complicated value base arrangement. A little bit of a background on our data journey. So best place to start is in 95, when our previous president, who just retired last week, um, started thinking that I have a lot of diabetes patients. Um, how many do I have? Maybe I could think of them as a collection. He had kind of this preliminary population health idea. So he just took an Excel workbook, you know, kept track of all of his diabetes patients in that workbook, and then just kind of tracked, you know, how they were doing. But realized, you know, I've got multiple people with these chronic conditions. Maybe I should think about them as a whole. So kind of had that really preliminary population health idea and said, you know, I'm going to use, let, let me just build a simple data set in Excel. From there, um, he had kind of more thirst to grow. So he worked with the, the hospital to get um, an extract from the lab data so he could build a real simple SQL database um, to add on to what he had been tracking in Excel. Um, and then about over the next decade, um, continued to expand, you know, bringing in more data sources, looking at more measures. Which brings us to 2012, which was the date I said on the previous slide where we started our MSSP track. So for any of you who've taken that journey into joining an MSSP track, when you do that, um, you the first thing I would mention is you get this huge set of Medicare claims data, which is an awesome data source. Um, so that kind of ups the ante of, okay, we need to do some of this data. Um, but then you also are, are responsible for a population of members, and you want to know as, many, as much about those members as possible. So really in 2012, we decided you know, we need to make more investment in this data space. So we, we partnered with Medventive and McKesson on a data product, used that for several years. But after 2012, we kept growing and growing and growing. And growth for us meant making our data um, situation more complicated because all of the markets we were adding in had different EMRs because that's the way our, our network had evolved. So um, come 2015, we found ourselves with the statewide ACO, uh, lots of different EMRs, more and more claims data. We needed to invest even further in something that could really handle this complicated data space. And that's when we partnered with Innovacer, which I'll talk a little bit more about later. So quickly about our strategic priorities, um, which I'm sure are very similar to what your organization's looking at. So we're looking at managing the risk of our population, the total cost of care of that population. Um, we're looking at lowering network, network leakage. So those people that we're managing that are going outside of um, our network for services. Um, with all that data, we really want to optimize what our care management staff is doing. So we do, I should have mentioned this on the background slide, we currently have 100, about 100 FTEs across the ACO in that care management role. So we really want to op optimize those resources. And then um, it's a very competitive, challenging industry. We want to identify growth opportunities. Um, and then most importantly, create value for our members. So, so again, those are our strategies. Those have been our strategies for a while. I mentioned in 2015, we're like, wow, um, we really need to make even further investment and changes with, with respect to data and IT. Um, and really found ourselves in a, in a similar si situation like this and still find ourselves in this because it's, we continue to face challenges. But um, may maybe like some of your markets, you know, today care is complicated. We have very complicated delivery systems. So, um, even if you look at one um, provider network, um, you've got multiple hospitals, multiple clinics. Some of those hospitals and clinics within a network may be in different tax IDs, so they may not even talk to each other from a data standpoint. And then there's competition in the market, and patients oftentimes have choice, especially in Medicare. So just a very complicated um, delivery system. So with that, um, whenever you have different data data elements like that, a complicated setup, communication gets harder and harder. Um, so you really need to um, look for ways to maybe close that communication gap. 
And then lastly, um, duplication of effort, and oftentimes duplication of services is taking place. So with this complicated delivery system, communication challenges, um, leading to duplication, um, and then let's talk about data. So with that, as I mentioned, so you have different data systems. So one clinic org um, may have a different EMR than another clinic or the hospital may be in a different EMR. None of them talk to each other, so no interoperability. Um, so it's just a really complicated data situation. And then let's say you fix all that. You got a perfect data situation. Um, then you literally have a million different options of what to analyze. You literally could look at um, thousands of iterations of analysis, so, it's, so where do you start? So for us, back to 2015, as we continue to pre press forward, um, you know, we had some really specific data needs, which you may find as well. So, so the first one is we really needed some help with the data aggregation and normalization. So I'll talk a little bit more, but I'll remind you of the EMR situation I, I faced with. So different EMRs across the state. So how can I get those EMRs to talk to each other? As we join more and more shared savings arrangements, um, both Medicare, managed Medicaid, commercial, we wanted to monitor the status of those programs. So payers will give you reports, and those are helpful reports, but um, if you're getting data and you're feeling the pressure, probably doing your own reports and doing them quicker is very valuable. So that was very much a data need for us. Then with care management, I, I mentioned we have 100 FDEs across the state, so a fairly large investment. Um, we've got 300,000 members we need to manage. Um, that's a pretty big task that you can you could maybe triumph over without IT help, but obviously data and IT is going to help make that more automated. So really wanted to um, so it's continually focus for us to really help care management. And then obviously important for anybody in the data IT world, security, privacy, um, you know, key components for us. And then lastly, analytics. So as I mentioned, once you have the data, you've got thousands of different things you can do with it, but there's a few strategies that stand out. So obviously, um, you know, we want to you know, dive into that and see, um, we want to be able to analyze the data for strategic insights. So we decided to partner with Innovacer in 2015. We needed, a, we needed a partner who could, who wasn't intimidated by our data situation. And I think it starts with the EMRs. So across my network, um, I have over 15 different EMRs that don't talk to each other. So within each of those markets, they're, they're obviously using the EMRs for, for their clinical reasons um, the best that they can. But from a population health standpoint, a statewide network, 15 different EMRs, um, I can't do anything with that. And, I, and we were not in a place to invest in one EMR, right? That's a huge project, that's a huge investment. So really what we needed to do was take advantage of big data technology and partner with a company who was experienced with taking out clinical data and then creating, not an EMR, because we don't manage an EMR at the ACO, but a view of the EMR. So we've essentially created a universal view of the EMR. So we've taken all 15 of those EMRs, pulled out all of the key clinical components, created a universal EMR view for our network so that we can see patients across that continuum. So an example I'll give is Iowa's a very rural, a very rural state, but Des Moines is a fairly large metropolitan area. We have um, about 10 critical access hospitals around Des Moines. So that's where patients are going for a lot of their primary care services, but a lot of the specialists and a lot of their inpatient admins are happening in, in Des Moines. So just that rural population alone, if I only had access to that rural EMR, I'd be missing out on all the specialist um, visits they're taking in Des Moines. I'd be missing out on any of the hospital admits. So, so bottom line is we needed to get this universal view of our, of our members. So we made that shift. We invested. Um, to, to extract the EMR data, to create, that, um, to, to create that universal view. And there were some other data points that made that need even bigger. So I, I alluded to claims earlier. So any of um, those of you in this room who have worked with claims, um, and I'll, I'll, I'll pick on Medicare claims, but I'll do it in a positive way. Medicare shared savings claims is some of the best data I've ever seen in terms of expansiveness. 
any of you from a data background, you get Medicare shared savings data, it is as expansive as possible. Um, but it's pretty complicated to start from day one. So it comes in 15 different files with different standards that have very specific rules on how they talk to each other. Um, and while it's expansive, Medicare is not creating data feeds that are good for Nathan Riggle as a data scientist. They have a very specific purpose of why they're using claims, right? So, so I love how expansive the data is, but because I'm in analytics, I want to be opportunistic. I have to be strategic on how I translate those Medicare claims so that I can then analyze certain things. I can, you know, I can track a patient through s several different points. So I I'm touching on claims here because that was the other complicated piece of our data puzzle of solving the EMRs, needing to solve the claims, um, the size of all of that data, not to mention we included billing data from all of my organizations. So with that, um, by making that data investment, we were then set up to begin to look at some of the strategies you'll see on the right of the slide. So those are essentially a summary of you know, what I had said the AC my ACO strategies were. So you know, population health, risk management, care coordination, um, quality reporting, predictive analytics. Um, with that data investment, we're now able to start to look at these things. So he, on this slide, here's an example of some of the analysis we do. Um, so we do several, you know, depending on the need, depending on the data, we'll dig into several different things. But here's some of the, you know, here's some of the straightforward examples of analysis we do on our data sets. So um, we look at we look at this high risk segmentation question and are constantly asking ourselves, what's the definition of high risk we need to focus on from a care management standpoint? And any of you that are in this world or experience with segmentation, you don't, want to, you don't want to get too complicated, but you don't want to get too simple. So we're constantly looking at different things and helping it evolve. So we look at hospital admissions. We look at um, ED utilization. We look at diagnoses, chronic diseases. Um, look at all those different things that we really weren't able to look at if not for having this claims data set with this EMR data set all in one place that we could take advantage of those different elements. So the team I manage, you know, I, I think in my introduction it was mentioned, you know, I manage this, these um, IT projects, but I also manage a team of data analysts. So what, we're, what I had that data analytics team focused on is doing that discovery phase of analysis. So Innovacer, our, our vendor, they make the data available, that my data scientists can go directly into it, we can extract it, we can model it in R, and start to look for the different insights. So I take a very minimal viable product approach when it comes to analytics. I want to find the insight first. We really discovery, mine the data. And then once we have those insights, then I love taking advantage of an automated platform because I don't like to do reporting. Um, I prefer to do consulting and analytics. So once I found those insights, then I'm like, okay, this insight's important to us. I need to automate it. So, on top of our data platform, we have a BI tool that looks very common to the, the main BI tools in the market that will then automate those reports so that we can then look, we can then model the things specific to value-based contracts, specific to um, different populations. We can push that to our leaders and our care management team. So I mentioned before that care management and optimizing that team was key for us as well. So another thing we wanted to take advantage of this data lake that has all this EMR data, has all this claims data, has all this analytics, is we wanted that to touch our care managers as well. So this is the platform. We actually then designed this care management platform on top of all of that data work to then manage all of the work that they do as well. So that enables them to get all that data from the EMRs, from the claims, from my analytics team, um, and then allows them to do all of their protocols, which I'll summarize here. But then back to me, selfishly as a data person, I then get to track all the work they're doing. So then I'm able to track all of those touch points, and I'm able to add that back into my data model and analyze that further. 
so, so our care management strategy is we, we look at protocols um, for different patient populations, so specifically high risk. We have automated protocols that once we've put someone in that high risk segment, it pushes that patient to the, the assigned care manager and then walks through these steps. So the initial face-to-face -face visit, the discussion of the conditions and medications, the red flags, the discussion of self-management, et cetera. So visually, here's an example of what that looks like. So, so again, all of that data is feeding this. It's helping me define what patients my care manager should be talking to. It's then launching these protocols for that care management staff to do their care management work. So here's, a, here's just a screenshot of um, a high-risk protocol, which they'll then, they'll then work through with those patients. And um, again, I'll be able to track the data to see how those engagements are going. So there's four themes we look at when it comes to care management um, and you know, what triggers that work. So I, I talked about high risk a second ago, but I think it's important to kind of go through all four of these. So, so again, just to, to recap, one large data lake that allows me to do analytics, allows me to do reporting, and then I have this care management component attached to it. Um, so the first theme I'll, I'll mention here is event-based. So one of the pieces that we've also ingested into our EMR, or sorry, to our data lake, is the ADTs from all of the hospitals in our network. So we have, um, we have eight large hospitals, 25 critical access hospitals. I get the ADTs for those hospitals every night. So those get automatically extracted, placed in my data lake, and then if any of my 300,000 lives have been admitted from an inpatient or ED standpoint, I'm sending an automatic trigger to my care managers. So that's that event-based theme to start with. The next one is closing gaps in care. So gaps in care can be really well defined because Medicare has said, here's the quality measures we're gonna measure you on, or some other contract has done that. So we can either look at those very well defined gaps in care, or we can define our own because we've identified it as a high risk gap, et cetera. So what we'll do is we'll look at, I'll just pick out annual wellness visits, very specific Medicare um, quality measure. We'll look to see who hasn't had the annual wellness visit um, in the last 12 months, and we'll push that to our care managers as well. So again, we're scanning the claims data. We're also looking at the EMR to see, okay, who hasn't had this, and then we push it to those care managers. The third theme about this kind of care management IT philosophy is this, the improved communication. So one of the challenges I mentioned on an earlier slide is this care continuum is pretty wide. And it's pretty diverse too, right? It's across hospitals, clinics, specialists, nurses, care managers, providers. So we use our health coaches to try to be that continuation point throughout that. Um, but we also use the data to be the continuation point. So we really take all of the encounters we're seeing for our members and we're building that out in a, as a timeline on their page in our system to really to paint that picture of um, co continuation of care. So I'm looking for what encounters they've had at clinics, at hospitals, uh, medications, et cetera. And then I'm having my care managers who are working with those patients, they're completing those protocols, they're adding notes, that's added to that timeline as well. So we're really trying to use this data and then this human work of the care manager to really create this continuation um, view that we can use. And then lastly, this is really the theme, this is a new theme that we've really moved to last, in the last year from a more innovative standpoint, is the concept of community resources. So there's a lot of research out there about how so, uh, social determinants of health impact individuals' um, health. So we've spent a lot of, you know, we looked at that research, we said how can this work for our ACO? We've actually um, started a pilot program where we actually have community health workers in clinics screening patients um, if, if, a need is, if a need is called out. That resource is then working with that patient to then close that need from a community resources standpoint. And again, that's done through my system. So I'm, I'm feeding data to those community health workers. I'm tracking, what they're, I'm tracking what they're doing with it. 
And then we're looking at the outcomes, like is there positive outcomes for our patients with these community resources, and do I need to expand this program because there's a greater need out there. So a little bit of summary on each of those. So I, I, talked, about the, I talked about the event driven triggers. So again, the, um, the, the health care measure we'd be doing with that is trying to decrease readmission rate. So again, I'm triggering every night, someone that's been admitted, that's going to, that triggers going to the acute staff member. They are then responsible for that patient while they're admitted, and as soon as they're discharged, it automatically triggers to my ambulatory um, health coach who's then responsible for that transition. So that process of the automatic trigger going through the continuum is really helping to reduce readmissions by really you know, looking for that strong care in the 30 to 90 days after discharge and then um, enabling better communication. Related to that um, is ED utilization. So I was talking about readmissions there. Closely related to that is just ED utilization. So, so with this, again, I'm getting that trigger for the ED admin. That's, the ED admin, though, is actually going to the ambulatory setting, unless the ED admin leads to an inpatient admin. So oftentimes, an ED admin is a very quick encounter with respect to a, a full admin. That's going to my ambulatory health coach, who's immediately trying to engage with that patient and talk to them about what their, that care need was, um, to, to first address that care need, but then also work to kind of build up that health to provide better health for that patient beyond going to the ED. So gaps in care, again, I, we used annual wellness visits later. There's, there's tons of different gaps you can do from a quality standpoint. Um, with that, we're scanning the data system to say, okay, who's, who's missing a certain clinical encounter? Who's a diabetes patient or a hypertension patient or a COPD patient who's missing that important encounter? We're trying to, we're obviously thrilled if we see there's no problem. We're still tracking that. So we're like, great, I'm thrilled this patient is seeing their doctor on the right cadence. But if not, it becomes a gap and we're pushing that to the health coach to then work to close that gap. And then annual wellness visits, which I mentioned earlier. Um, so a very, and, and I think PCP visits is another great one here especially because PCP spans the whole age continuum, but um, a really key measure and a really key health outcome, you know, is that, um, is that annual wellness or PCP visit. So really looking who's due for that and then assigning that work to maybe someone um, who's more responsible for calls. So, hey, we need to make this call to this, this population. We'll push that list to that group, have them make the calls and work to close that gap. So I've mentioned communication a, a few times, but now that I've gone through some of those care management examples, I can maybe paint an even a better picture. So again, there's several, you know, for a member, especially a high-risk member, there's several touch points um, throughout the care continuum. So there's all of their encounters with the clinic, with the hospital. Um, so we're using our data lake to combine the EMR data, the claims data, to really paint that full picture. And then we're also embedding all of that care management data into a timeline so that we can really paint the most clear picture possible and look for any gaps in communication. So, you know, gaps to begin with is a, is a communication breakdown. If someone hasn't gone in for their annual wellness visit, some communication broke down. Well, with having kind of this full picture, this timeline really helps to minimize those gaps that you might encounter. So then with community resources, I mentioned this a second ago, I'll talk to you a little bit about this pilot. So um, like I said, over the last year, this is really a focus area for us to say, um, I hate to use the term ROI in a healthcare setting, but there is some strong ROI when you think about a community health worker program. You think about resources that for at least our model don't have to have as extensive training. So we can acquire them quicker, we can deploy them sooner in clinic settings. And they can help patients with needs that don't require that important healthcare touch. So whether it be transportation, food, um, literacy, cleanliness of the home, things like that. So we have a very, um, very appropriate screening 
that again we wanted to incorporate with our data platform. So we actually, for this example, partnered with Innovacer to build the screening tool, which is an app on iPads that is deployed in our three pilot clinics. Um, and every patient that comes through goes through that screening. So they're asked if they have any of these needs. If there is a need, an automatic trigger is sent to both the provider, the health coach, and the community health worker to then meet with that patient before they leave the clinic. Um, and then that data is captured back in our system. And again, it's added to that care continuum. So with that, um, you know, that's data that we're really, we're excited about that pilot, but now we have the data to analyze the effectiveness to decide, um, you know, how do we expand this um, and look forward to expanding it. So now I'm gonna move it a little bit into our results and what this slide represents is what, the, what Mercy ACO has earned, which you can see in the red bar from a shared payment standpoint. So this is the sum of the checks we're receiving back for all of our um, value-based contracts. Now one thing that you would say to looking at a chart like this is this is driven by the volume of your contracts, right? And that's, that's absolutely accurate. The more contracts in, you're in, the more checks you're going to get. But the reason I think it ties to a data IT conversation is you cannot take on more value-based contracts without analyzing the data, without having the infrastructure to manage that as well. So, um, so again, you know, we're very happy with this performance. Again, a lot of it's volume-based, but we needed the infrastructure in place to be able to take on more risk and also more contracts to manage more lives to, to receive these payments. And then from a key outcome standpoint, just kind of highlighting some of the, the items I've addressed previously. Um, you know, in 2017, where we've, where we've most recently um, analyzed a lot of this performance, so we saw a 7% reduction in ED utilization, or sorry, in readmit rate, 6.6% uh, 6 .6 reduction in ED utilization. So that goes back to those triggers I talked about, that automated, automated um, inpatient admin trigger, and then that automated ED admin trigger, and then the coordination between our hospital and ambulatory health coaches. Um, with all that, we've seen an increase in primary care services, an increase in annual wellness visits, and then you know, if we look back to the start of the ACO and we analyze all of the expense savings, um, a pretty large, uh, pretty large reduction in overall expenditures. So a couple closing thoughts before we open it up to questions. So I think the first one being, um, we have a lot of data. That's just been the nature of the world evolving. Um, big data has allowed us to create and store more data. In the healthcare world, um, different, evolve, different evolving points have allowed us to get more and more data as well. So depending on your situation, whether it's just your EMR and your local billing or you're in value-based contracts where you get a lot of claims, you're getting lots of data. Now you can have excellent care, great outcomes without major investments, but there obviously does come a point where to get that extra edge, it does help to be able to, to look at the data to really paint that full picture. Um, prioritization is also key. So again, analysis paralysis was a term used on a previous slide. Um, there's lots of different things you can analyze. What I would recommend from an analytic approach is once you have your data in place, um, really dive into that data internally to say, okay, what are, what are some insights that stand out to us? Or what's the research say? You know, go to maybe secondary research. So really do some of that own analytics work yourself. And then with that, then prioritize the key insights you care about and then automate that reporting. Because again, if you have, if you have internal resources for data and analytics, ideally those resources should be deployed to that strategic kind of data mining exercise and let the reporting become automated. Although a lot of us still get, um, are still doing a lot of reporting, let that be automated after you found the insights. With that, um, data IT can really enable care management, really help optimize those processes. It can automate, it can provide additional data value. So Mercy ACO is a big proponent in that. And then lastly, um, you know, look at your situation with your organization and where you think you might be growing. Um, again, there's likely a minimal viable alternative for you to start making the right moves, um, but, but be ambitious to an extent that don't let, don't let 15 EMRs stand in your way. 
um, you know, if you have a strategic need to grow, there are, there are partners out there that will help you um, tackle some of your, your major data and IT challenges and will allow you to start to get more value from that. So with that, um, that's the end of my presentation. I, I forgot to mention at the beginning, um, a reminder to do your speaker evaluations. Uh, we've all been asked to remind you of that. Um, but I, the timer didn't start, so I don't know how much time we have, but I'm guessing we do have some time for Q&A. So um, any questions? My name's Dave Bloomquist. I'm with Wellstar Health System uh, outside of Atlanta. This um, effort that you have um, endeavored, is this strictly for those patients, that population that's covered under your ACO, or do you also apply it more broadly to those lives that aren't covered under those contracts? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so most of what I've just described today is very focused on that 300,000 population, but we're pushing ourselves to go beyond that. So obviously the care of our overall organization goes beyond that 300,000. Because of these different value-based arrangements um, we t and the, the lives we're attributed to and the claims we get for those folks, you're naturally pulled to what you're, you're covering, but we are absolutely trying to take these advantages and apply it beyond that. Um, as well as those that perhaps you haven't undertaken those in, in terms of funding in the future? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the question of stop funding, it's a little bit of a tough one just because innovation really keeps you from de deinvesting in um, certain things. Um, you know, the only thing that really stands out to me right now in terms of stop funding is are the things that we're measuring that we're not seeing value. So there is not a major investment we've made that we're walking away from but we are looking to continue to see, okay, what is the value of each of these programs? Um, so no major things that stand out from, from a um, stop investing standpoint. The new investment, um, great question. You know, one of them I can mention is as we continue to look at the care continuum, post-acute has continued to be a pain point for us, especially for that Medicare population. So investment and really kind of tightening that network and getting more insights there. Um, largely, I would say, we're also kind of at the point where we've made some really great data and IT investments. Selfishly, my next investments are focused on talent to continue to bring more talent in. Because I have, I don't have enough, I have so much data I can't get to all of it that I want to. So it's really now bringing in the best statistical talent to help with that. Yeah. primary care practices that obviously don't have the resources, so we have to prioritize who we yep. manage? No, good question. I would say overall, our patient risk model is still very much in an infant stage and is growing. So impactable readiness are things we're wanting to add on. We haven't done that today, but those are pieces we're planning to add on, absolutely. Sure. Which MSSP track are you in this year, since they've been renamed? Um, so this year, we're st we didn't change any names this year. So we're in one track. We're in a track three, a one plus, and then two track ones. Okay. And then you talked broadly about the process of building the data lake and marrying all of those data feeds together. Can you tell me a little bit about the in-depth process of patient match and trying to mitigate that disparate data in mm -hmm. such a large undertaking? Sure. So the patient match piece is fairly simple. I think our, our partner in Avacer, but I think probably a lot of vendors have kind of cracked the nut of patient match. Those algorithms are pretty established in terms of um, most of that, that modeling is fairly well established. You should have a decent patient match if you have enough of those fields to match on. The overall build, though, of the data, um, that is quite complex. 
the 15 EMRs I have had very different standards. So unfortunately, we really had to invest a ton of local knowledge in those differences so we could normalize them. So that was quite challenging. And then back to claims data, especially Medicare. Medicare data, um, we still haven't figured out everything we can do with that Medicare claims data. We've got it to a point where we can do some fairly great reporting, but there's even more things we can transform with that claims feed to get more value out of it. Are there any plans to open up that data in a more interdisciplinary fashion to allow clinicians and other people to leverage that investment? For sure. So I get this question a lot, what are providers doing with the system? Not a lot today. That's definitely, should have probably even been honored. That's one of our strategic priorities. Um, we're still trying to optimize a few of the other things I mentioned. Um, but absolutely getting this data in the hands of providers is key. I'll be quite honest with you, and maybe some of you have, I don't have the perfect solution in getting providers engaged across the continuum yet either, though. So, I'm, I mean, so we want, it, we want it to be impactful, simple, et cetera. Um, but that, so that's absolutely on our, um, that's on our trajectory, but we have not implemented that or figured out the exact perfect solution. I should have told her no, because she stole part of my question. Oh, sorry. Um, so to extend that past the, uh, the clinicians, any use of this at the lab level from a chemistry, hematology, micro standpoint, or any goal for that? Yeah, great question. Um, the only thing we've really come up with from a lab standpoint is looking at utilization of services in labs and seeing if there's any cost efficiencies there, which I know wasn't your question. Um, so to go to the specifics of your question, n no, not yet. But as I go to different conferences like this, I'm always blown away to hear what other organizations are doing from utilize, like an EMR, I, I was saying how much claims data is great, EMR data is outstanding as well. Like all of that deep rich clinical data in there can provide so much great research and clinical value. Um, so that's something I'm excited about personally, and that's, but that's probably more of a two year horizon for us to begin to go down. Mm -hmm. um, does your system at all help to capture that and ensure that you're maximizing that to its full extent? Yeah. So risk adjustment is major for Medicare shared savings. So we have, as an ACO, actually have a team of CDI professionals, so clinical documentation improvement professionals, who are taking their knowledge to, to take the data from the system to scan through those codes. So currently our system is enabling that work but enhancing that further is a next step. So we actually have some growth plans for that area. We have the data, we kind of have the design, we've already started doing some of that, but we definitely plan to do more of that. I'm Dr. Paul Grundy, I'm, I'm the Chief Transformation Officer at Innovacer. There was a great article about three months ago in JAMA that demonstrated that 72% of folks with type 2 diabetes who were hospitalized for hypoglycemia were in the last four days of their pay period. Hmm. A and with that in mind, how are you getting at that community, community social worker, the community coordinator, in engaging those kinds of issues in Iowa? I mean, do you have mm -hmm. the ability to impact some of that, some of that, uh, some of those issues that result in? Uh, yeah, so with type 2. risk for managing the population? Sure, yeah, I, that's a, I would say that that question of diabetes and spiking with paychecks, to, you know, when that financial need gets greater, that probably falls with our community health workers and our care managers. So, um, so but, but that's also where they merge, right? So I, we're not doing some, anything specific to that today, but when it comes to community health workers and then some of the patient risk modeling someone brought up earlier, we're constantly looking at that secondary research and seeing, you know, what, what are some of those additional triggers we can look at. So, so right now it's very much about um, identifying the need and meeting that need, but um, if you're sitting on a lot of data, you probably should get more sophisticated, and that's a great example. Can you talk about the infrastructure that you built out, whether this is a Hadoop cluster, or no, SQ, no SQL or SQL yep. environment, and then the scope and size of it? Yeah, so it is Hadoop infrastructure. Um, because of some of our corporate IT standards, we actually had to build it all, all out on local servers. So our developers um, do everything AD, uh, from an AWS standpoint, uh, and they deploy that code to our servers where we're storing all of our Hadoop. 
talk about the size and scope of it? Yeah, sure. So si terabytes or something. Yeah, so that's, I actually have a manager who manages those hardware questions, so that specific question's a little out of my scope. Um, but we're talking in the billions of data points, so I, I can't speak to the exact size, but it, it's a very, um, if you have um, three, if you have 100,000 or 80, 80 to 100,000 Medicare lives, you're already sitting on just a ton of data with that alone, and then obviously EMRs are huge sets. So, so sorry I can't speak to the exact technical specifics. You can probably hear it. So, um, uh, so other than those uh, notifications and someone reaching out to uh, those patients, that were, that were the other things you guys did because that seemed to really challenge. Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, I probably way oversimplified that ED utilization use case. Um, so the, e the notification triggers the process, so that way a health coach then gets assigned that patient, and then through that process, they're assigned several protocols. So I obviously don't have examples of those today, but we have um, multi-step processes to go through like an ED protocol. So th the real key is that that person has been assigned a health coach, and then that health coach has a multi-week, multi-step process to manage that person's care. So it's really that care coordination um, is really what we're doing today. Strictly based on um, the payer attributed, or do you do your own algorithms, or most visits in the last 12 months? Or? Yeah, great question. So we look at we we look at payer attribution for some certain contract views because at the end of the day, that's how the contract's measured. But in terms of our overall system and trying to make it as usable as possible, we do have an algorithm that looks at what the EMR says then looks at you know, visit history and then looks at what payer. So we, um, we try to, if, if we have good EMR data that says some, who someone's attributed to, we want to start there. And then we take other factors into consideration. People still don't love it, um, but it's obviously, I think, a step in the right direction. Um, but yeah, payer att or provider attribution is definitely a data challenge. And do you uh, prioritize one EMR over the other in terms of the bouncing back and forth? Yeah, great question. So in a perfect world, a uh, a uh, primary ambulatory EMR should track who a person's PCP is. So if you have a PCP you're seeing, that EMR should, with your name, list that PCP and ideally the MPI. So we are, we're, we're, um, we're making that our top, pri our top priority. And then beyond that, there's other EMRs, so specialists, hospitals, et cetera. We look to see if that patient showed up any of those and listed a PCP, and then we go down to the visit count and the payer side. Thank you. Are you using any of this data to drive down to the patient care level as far as driving down cost with vendors, supply chain? Are you moving into that area at all? Yeah, good question. We're starting to get, so just to recap my organization, Mercy ACO is a subsidiary of Mercy One. So from an ACO standpoint, you know, we're very focused on those value-based contracts, but we have the most built out kind of data IT team across the entire Iowa organization. So we're starting to get questions like that. So we have not, um, we have not completed any projects like that, but we are at the point where we're starting to take on questions across the network. And some of those um, cost and utilization um, items are coming our way. Nathan, this is Bhushan from Ascension Health. Um, great presentation, by the way. We're doing something very similar. I um, have many questions. One that I'll touch upon is, you mentioned that in your data platform, you've aggregated claims data from not just CMS, uh, CCLF files, but also commercial. Mm -hmm. Can you talk to some of the challenges you face in getting that data, getting that data in the first place, <laughs> and then getting that to the right, the same kind of level and you mm -hmm. know, merging it all in one place. Yeah. yeah, so getting claims from non-Medicare payers, um, is, it's moving in the right direction for us. We're getting close to enough of what we've asked for. Um, so how we got there is above my pay grade and it's in a payer strategy area. So, so fortunately for us, I think, but what I have supported is um, I really 
have my team focus on this, and then I have some of the internal consultants that ask the same questions. If we have data challenges from a payer claim set, or we think some things should be better, I'm, we're, we're really documenting that as much as possible. So annually, when we renew those contracts, that's key to that conversation. So really focusing on growth and really documenting that and coming up with a really strong presentation is, is helpful with respect to that. Um, they are not as expansive of, uh, as Medicare, I think you alluded to, um, but, but they're also a lot simpler to work with um, just because CCLF is quite complicated. So um, it's just a constant process of just having that dialogue about where we want that to improve. Any other questions? Yeah. And just to clarify, um, do you mean a specialist who may be chosen as someone's PCP, or do you mean attributing to a specialist because of some other? Like a cardiovascular, someone following a cardiac case. Sure. Um, so we have not created a secondary attribution model, which could be like a specialist attribution model. We more track that based on where the person showing up in the data. So obviously, if they're seeing that cardiovascular provider, like we're, we're, we're getting that data and we're seeing it. Um, the reason I asked the, my question is sometimes we're seeing cardiovascular um, providers showing up as PCPs for Medicare patients. So, so that's more of just like a data challenge we're trying to work out. But, um, but no, no secondary attribution for like specialists. But what I will say, and I touched on leakage earlier, out migration, you know, that losing claims from your attributed base is one of our major business focus areas. And what people really want to know, what the business people keep asking me is, okay, what is that, what's that provider flow for that patient? So obviously they're attributed to us, so they've seen us. Um, they're theoretically seeing other providers, and then we're losing them. Well, the nice thing about claims is once you've lost them, you can actually see where they went, so that's helpful. Um, so we're, we're investing a lot of time right now to take that humongous CMS data set and seeing it's, again, it's not structured to make that problem easy for Nathan. So we're actually um, really trying to structure that CMS data to really track that patient flow um, because we're getting a lot of questions like that. I will stick around afterwards outside, so um, if there's no other questions, thank you so much for attending and your um, focus.